that you walked into the men's dressing room on stage and you're like, what's this? And Johnny on stage, when he'd come and hug me, I'd be like, no. <laughs> so it was a great idea, and it was a great costume. Um, but I don't think by the end of 48 shows <laughs> that, it was, that it was quite so pleasant anymore. So there's, there's that mixed blessing, right? Um, you want, uh, as an actor, you want a costume that will let you do whatever, you, what, whatever comes into your brain, really, um, and will support you with that. Um, and that's very tricky because as a run goes on, the longer the run, the more stupid things come into actors' brains that they want to do, right? Because they, they got to feeling like, oh, this is boring, I should maybe do a handstand here or something. Um, and, and so then, then the costume is, is torqued. And we've all seen it, you know, kind of like three quarters of the way through a run, you go, what are you doing? Um, so the costume, um, it's great to have all that, that fabulous stuff, um, but then actually living in it is, is interesting, right? It's a process. Great. And I think it's actually important to look at what kind of king a person is. I mean, for me, it's always like, does this make you feel like the character? I mean, that's always a question I, in a fitting, I ask is, does this feel right? I mean, we all know we put on a pair of shoes, and depending on whether you're putting sneakers or dress shoes on, it's going to make you feel different. And I think that's the same for actors, is that you have to feel right. And if you're, you know, doing Time in of Athens versus Othello versus Macbeth versus you know, uh, Oberon, you're all going to be wearing slightly different things, to use Shakespeare as an example. But, you know, again, there's different aspects of that. And it's, for me, it's always more important to make sure that the, the performer feels right. Great. You got something? Um, so what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Is it easier to play a king wearing silk? I'd say no, I think you get paid to act. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough. Never enough. <laughs> and so far, so here we are in the Textile Museum, and so far we've been mostly talking about fabrics being used as costume pieces, but obviously they'll sometimes be used in scenery and uh, and set design as well. So I was wondering if you could maybe just touch on that a bit. Astrid, do you want to tell the paper story? Which paper story? <laughs> Harlem Duet. What's, what's the story? Well, Astrid and I worked on a show where I actually was the dyer. Oh, and that. We found New York. This, yeah, in New York. Mm -hmm. And we found this, well, Astrid found this fabulous paper at Rob Blotz. And how many rolls did you find? Oh, I've used that paper so many times. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, but yeah. thousands, millions and millions of yards. It's like, um, um, it's a kind of paper, a reinforced paper toweling. And they use it to do kind of hospital -y things, you know. And, and the fabulous thing about it as a dyer is that it doesn't fall apart when you, you, you can wring it out, you can wet it. And we were actually able to dye, and we used it at Soul Pepper for the maids and the Chekhov pieces, and then we went to Harlem Duet, and then you took it to a factory. But it was one of those things that we got to use, uh, like a fabric or a textile, as sort of a sculptural piece, but also as a fabric. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was great. And I think there's also many times where textiles can say more than actual architectural pieces or scenery, you know, and, and, and it... And I've used, as, um, as a designer, I've used uh, fabric as part of a set many times because I, I like textiles, I'm drawn to them. Um, and I think sometimes that they, they allow you to get more abstract in some ways than you do if you use real set pieces, so. I mean, I went to that paper because it was so cheap. I mean, it was really, mm -hmm. often that was the inspiration and uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately still is. But <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it needs to be fireproof. That's one of the things when you use textiles mm -hmm. or right. paper as textiles on stage. That's that gets expensive too to these consider. days. Consider that's one of the things yeah. you have to take in consideration. Um, but yeah, I've used textiles. I tell you, it makes a great touring set. Um, I did an opera in *Rape of Lucretia* for the COC a number of years ago, entirely out of out of that paper, actually. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I saw that. And, and then they wanted to bring it to Amsterdam, and it, we just folded it all up, and <laughs> off it went. And then we didn't uh, bother bringing it back. You know, it just it, it stayed there, which was right. great. Um, 
when um, when I, I I get a as as artistic director of Obsidian, I get a um, lot of people coming in. You know, show me designs. You know, looking for work, etc. And the thing that I can always tell about um, a set design is somebody will come in. It'll be a beautiful, and they'll be like hundreds of yards of material, you know, up to a 30-foot <laughs> grid and down. And I look at them and I go, that's really great. What university were you at when you did this? <laughs> because there isn't a single theater company that I know of that can afford that amount of textile anymore, you know? Um, and, 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 I mean, it's great. It's, it, and you look, I mean, it's more theoretical. Yeah, very, very. But, but, it, but it's wonderful, I mean, because there are some places which can do, you know, mm -hmm. um, all of that. Uh, the parachute silk, you know, the, the, the 200 yards of parachute silk and stuff. Um, and, I, and I love it, and I think it presents um, great opportunities for um, a synergy between the set and the lighter, lighting designer, mm -hmm. and, and it can be magnificent. And it can also look really horrible. Yeah. That's the thing that about, I mean, it's really up to the lighting designer anyway, most, mm -hmm. I think all, everything I do is up to the lighting designer. But, but especially when you use textile, in, on stage because mm -hmm. it can look like old dirty laundry <laughs> yeah. or you know it can be the worst and it can be just or when you're using silk to be the mm -hmm. silk water or yeah, you know, yeah, all yeah. these things you do um, if they're not lit well they're awful but if they're lit um, well they really are magic so you got to get a good lighting designer in addition to a good cutter. <laughs> <laughs> so far they don't need us at all. It's like, no, no. The actors, we don't care. Yeah. And I think it helps knowing what fabrics do because certain fabrics react differently to air movement and, and light. And so it, all, it does help if you're a designer to know what's a thing with knowing what you can do with a, a costume. It's just knowing what fabric, how it reacts. We, uh, when in Intimate Apparel, it was, um, uh, which is a show I, I have to say I, I, I love, and it's and it's been done I don't know thirty forty productions in the states, and it's constantly being done. It's it's probably the only surefire hit show that I've ever ever seen. I mean, it just no matter who does it, it it, it always does fabulously. And there's um, the actor has in in the first act has to be in Panama, and the rest of the action is happening in New York and he eventually comes from Panama to New York and so he has to read letters and it's always really tricky right I mean as an acting thing it's hard to do and I kind of got this idea that um, if he's really in Panama and nobody else in the show can actually see him why is the audience seeing him and so therefore we hung kind of um, something that was reminiscent of mosquito netting and lit it in such a way so that you couldn't see him. And it became a really interesting discussion because what I was happy to accept in terms of just a shadow, just a shape, just a you know part of a cheekbone with all you could see, a lot of people found that really um, disturbing. They wanted to see the actor. And, and it created the most controversy around the play was how the light and that fabric and that actor worked. And Lynn Nottage, who is the playwright, we brought her up from New York to see the opening. And she said she'd seen just about all the productions that had ever been done. And this is the first time somebody had hidden mm -hmm. George in the first act. She said, it makes really perfect sense. Mm -hmm. I kind of went, Great. <laughs> we did one thing right, you know. Um, but it was tricky because as a, as, a, as a director, I think you sometimes need more than the, the 3 a.m. idea when you're talking with a designer and a lighting designer. So when all of a sudden it is um, all your design team working on one moment, so the, the sound has to be at the right level, the fabric has to be just right, had to been dyed and treated just right, and then the lighting has to be perfect for that moment to work. And you somehow have to find the, the, the language that helps pull all of that together um, in a profound way. And that's really tricky. I, th I think um, all of those lessons that I thought were nonsense in theater school about <laughs> theater history and art, um, well, I was so wrong. Uh, <laughs> 
because you need to know all of that as a, as a director, uh, how that plays together. And I think it's very helpful in a sense as an actor because it, it means that, that they understand the choices that were made with fabrics and with silhouettes and with all of that kind of stuff. And it's coming from a real understanding from a historical perspective as opposed to, oh, I don't, I don't like pink. <laughs> I was just also wondering when you three go see a play, whether or not, whether or not you notice the costumes. I suspect I know the answer, but <laughs> if you, could, you know, like, what is it that you think maybe that you're looking at that the people in the row behind you aren't seeing? Well, it's it's one of those things that when I do actually go to see a show, and I don't think about the costumes. <laughs> then I know it's, it's actually a pretty amazing thing. And um, it's interesting going to uh, theater with my parents because they see completely different things. But I do, I, re I mean, everybody, I'm sure here, depending on your specialty or your experience as a, either a theater person or a non-theater person, I think you connect to certain things. And for me, I do, it because I do mostly costume design and I work mostly with fabrics, is that if I see something doesn't make sense, then I do focus on that more than, I, and I always think as a designer, if nobody mentions the costumes, because I do a lot of contemporary stuff and I do a lot of film, is if, I, I think the biggest compliment actually is if nobody mentions the costumes, then in some way I've done a really good job because that person is become a person more than what they're wearing. So that's my perspective. <laughs> You said earlier about serving the world of the play and creating that, um, and I think I think that's. I was a, on a Dora jury and I was on the general division, so I think I saw like eighty four shows, and it's hard because you're kind of going best costume, right? And and the majority of the plays are modern, and you know everybody's rated uh, Value Village, <laughs> and, and, and and created the the, 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 the wardrobe. But that being said, what I quickly learned that it wasn't uh, the show, there was a show at uh, Mervish, and it was a guy who was a quick change artist. And he had mm, 350 of the most fantastic costumes in the world. And his whole show was turning around a corner and coming out in a new costume. Right, and, and and then he would, you know, the video, and, and it was it was it was just like one one magical expensive costume after another, um, you know, and, and and at no point did that really enter the running for best costume design, because it wasn't kind of serving the world of the play, and and so even if it was a, a modern day piece, it was all about that fit. And if it fit well, then it got higher marks as, as to where the costume was to go. So interestingly enough, it wasn't the period pieces. It wasn't necessarily the fancy stuff. It was the ones that integrated play and direction and lighting and, mm -hmm. and, and became uh, the synergy of the whole as opposed to a separate piece. Um, well, I think it depends on what it is you're seeing. You know, there are shows that you really do see for the costumes, and there are shows that you're talking about that you don't. Um, I notice, if, if I notice something, um, it might be because I recognize it from a store on Queen Street. <laughs> 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 or from a fabric I've used, or God forbid, <laughs> worn, or... <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I would agree that generally, you know, you, you don't want to notice them. But of course, if you're doing Baroque theater, you mm -hmm. want the costume to be very noticed. Mm -hmm. right. And then I guess what I look for is how well made they are and how well they fit mm -hmm. and how well the, the actor can play with them, mm -hmm. and, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and also in terms of um, uh, what we would call remedial costuming, like where you take uh, where you take um, and 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 in, you know make an actor's uh, physique more of what you might want, like you make someone look taller, or you make you know you make someone look slimmer, or all, or you would add to make a character bigger or fatter, or all these kind of things, and 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 see how well that kind of tune tunes. In.